Good morning, everyone. I want to thank all New Yorkers who went out and voted yesterday. I want to thank the poll site workers, the campaign volunteers, everyone who was part of Election Day yesterday. We marked a powerful moment, an election as we are coming out of COVID, an election in the aftermath of the greatest crisis New York City has ever faced. And talk about proof of the strength of New York City. I keep saying there's no stop in New York, and yesterday was further proof of it. New Yorkers came out in strong numbers to vote to make an imprint on the future of this city. And that makes me really happy. You know, given the fact that COVID uh, was such a presence during this campaign. In fact, for so much of the campaign, Candace couldn't go out into communities the way we historically have, couldn't connect with people. Uh, and yet we saw a very healthy turnout. Uh, that's really encouraging. So thank you to everyone who was a part of it. The latest information we have, total turnout, 944,000 voters. Um, that, again, especially against the backdrop of everything that happened in the course of last year and this year, that's encouraging. And the voting's over, but now the counting begins. So obviously, uh, three uh, candidates in particular, Eric Adams, Maya Wiley, Catherine Garcia, uh, in strong positions. The count now will go on. Uh, now, let's be clear, absentee ballots have to be counted. Uh, ranked vote tabulation next week, full certification July 12th. So we got a ways to go here. Um, I think it's really important to note, uh, even with the new system, election day went pretty damn smoothly, and that's good news. And to all the candidates, uh, congratulations on your races. Uh, we are gonna be watching to make sure that we get the word out to all New Yorkers exactly how this process is unfolding, because it's brand new. We educated folks on how ranked choice voting worked originally. We're gonna keep educating people on how the count goes, but as of this morning, certainly, you know, New Yorkers can be proud. A good, strong turnout. Uh, election day, it went very smoothly in the scheme of things. A lot to be proud of, everyone. Okay, now, while we're waiting for the results of the primary, we keep moving forward with the number one thing we have to do, which is get COVID out of our town once and for all. Vaccinations continue, and we will deepen them as of this morning. Uh, total number of doses from day one, 9,046,573. Um, we are going to keep innovating new ways to get people the vaccine, new ways to make it work for them. We are now embarking on the summer of New York City. We know that the more people get vaccinated, the better we are, the more freedom we have, more vaccinations equals more freedom. So starting today, a brand new approach. We're expanding in-home vaccinations, in-home vaccinations for anyone who wants one. Uh, this is really important for folks who are ready, have not yet been vaccinated, but for whom it's been a challenge to get to a vaccination site or they haven't been sure. That vaccine, that life-saving vaccine is now available right at your doorstep. So we know from the effort we made to reach homebound New Yorkers how successful the approach was. We reached over 15,000 New Yorkers with the Homebound campaign. And thanks again to the Department for the Aging, to uh, the FDNY, to everyone who was a part of that very successful effort. We're gonna take the same kind of approach and now apply it to a bigger in-home vaccine effort. Anyone who's sitting out there and thinking, wow, I'm ready, but I'd rather the vaccine be done right here in my home, go to nyc.gov slash home vaccine, fill out the request, and we'll send the vaccinators to your door. Now, crucial to our vaccination effort has been health and hospitals. The hospitals and clinics of health and hospitals have been stellar. That is the word for it, stellar in addressing this crisis. This has been health and hospitals' finest hour, unquestionably, in their whole history. Um, amazing achievements in the fight against COVID. And today, a milestone, a wonderful milestone. Health and Hospitals will be giving its one millionth dose of the COVID vaccine. This really shows the reach and the impact of Health and Hospitals. Thank you to everyone who works for Health and Hospitals for what you do for this city. It is making extraordinary impact. And look, our public hospitals and clinics 
overwhelmingly are where the biggest COVID challenges were. They were at the front line. They persevered. Their communities rallied around them. This is a heroic story. When people talk about the fight against COVID and where it was toughest, that's where health and hospitals was. When we talk about fighting disparity and the inequalities in our society, that's what health and hospitals has been doing for generations. And it became clearer than ever in the vaccination effort. Our efforts to bring more and more vaccination equity into play are led by health and hospitals. And they are vaccinating significantly more people of color uh, than other hospitals because of who they are, where they are, the approach they take to the community. So this is a moment to celebrate the incredible impact of health and hospitals. I'm looking forward to honoring so many H&H &H employees during our hometown Heroes Parade next month. But now we have a little moment of history that we can all join in together, the one millionth dose. So we're gonna go live right now to Coney Island Hospital and to the CEO of Coney Island, Svetlana Lipanskaya, and she is there with Kira McAvoy, who will be the recipient of the one millionth dose. Kira is 12. One millionth dose. Kira. We had a little feedback there. Okay. Kira is 12 years old, the daughter of a Coney Island Hospital employee, excited to get the vaccine and get her life back to normal. She's going into eighth grade in September and looking forward to going back to school. And among her favorite activities are drama and dance. And we want her to have a great school year. And that begins with getting vaccinated. So I'm going to turn it over now to Svetlana to tell us what's going on out there at Coney Island and to honor this big moment. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good morning and welcome to Coney Island Hospital. We're incredibly excited to be administering the one million dose for New York City Health and Hospitals. Today with us, we have our nurse, Chelsea Whitfield, who will be administering the vaccine to Kira McAvoy, as you mentioned, who's 12 years old. She's here with her parents, uh, Jeff and Adele McAvoy, and as well as administering the second dose to uh, Francisca Lind, uh, who is a 71-year-old resident of South Brooklyn, and is uh, a patient here at Coney Island Hospital. So I'll turn it over to them. Uh, this is a very exciting moment, and thank you so much for letting us participate. All right. right. They're getting ready there. Getting ready right there. Okay, I think and I we are waiting to see the vaccination right now. Okay, everyone now, I'm gonna, is Svetlana going to narrate or else I will, that we see now the uh, health and hospitals workers starting to give the vaccines and some good history being made out there in Coney Island. And we're really happy. I wanna thank everyone who works at Coney Island Hospital. Um, it is great to see the one millionth dose given by health and hospitals. And to remember that not so long ago, uh, we were just hoping and praying we would have a vaccine, and now we have it, and over 9 million doses given in the city, 1 million given at health and hospitals alone. Absolutely amazing. And an example of getting our youngest New Yorkers vaccinated to help them get back to school and live full lives. And finally, as we said, really being clear about the fact that this is how we fight disparity through our public hospitals and clinics that are doing more and more to reach communities uh, with innovative approaches. Uh, this is really making a huge difference. We're gonna hear from Dr. Mitch Katz, uh, who's going to talk to us about this overall effort. And I wanna emphasize, uh, Dr. Katz has really focused on the question of equity and how health and hospitals could be part of the solution. He's gonna go over 
the facts that are quite striking about the role health and hospitals has played uh, as an agent of equity in the vaccination effort. Dr. Katz. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. And I know that you love New York City and Brooklyn history. So I have to tell you, uh, before we talk about the amazing history, um, that my great-great-grandmother, not my grandmother, but my great-great-grandmother was treated at Coney Island Hospital when she broke her hip uh, about 80 years ago. And the treatment at that time was mo uh, uh, immobilization, which they did by putting, uh, we, I see the clapping, and I saw that the one million one dose, that's great. So uh, the treatment at that time was sandbags on the leg to prevent movement so that the fracture would heal. And I always wondered if they got the sand from the beach itself at Coney <laughs> Island. Uh, but uh, talking about today's history, um, that w that you just saw made, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much for how you have led us throughout this uh, crisis. Uh, thank you to Svetlana and Coney Island for all their hard work. We are so proud, not only that we're at uh, one million vaccinations, but even more importantly, sir, you've talked throughout about our need to address in New York City the terrible disparities that we've seen under COVID. And I'm so proud that in the graph you put up there before, you can see that health and hospitals vaccinated 76% of the people uh, that we vaccinated were people of color. Uh, that compares to the independent hospitals at 73%. They also did a great job, but compared to the hospital systems overall uh, in New York City, they're at 56%. So hugely higher rates of vaccinating people of color for health and hospitals and the independent hospitals. And I think this proves what you've said all along, that public systems are critical to achieving equity. And we're just so proud to be part of it. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much, Mitch. Listen, Mitch, you have a lot to be proud of. One million doses just in health and hospitals, hospitals and clinics, really amazing, but also leading the way on equity. Um, this is another example to people of this city. Health and hospitals went through tough times and now has made a stunning comeback. A comeback that really will be the model for the comeback in New York City in so many ways. Health and hospitals is literally stronger than it's ever been at any point in their history. Doing amazing work, doing the work of equity, also guaranteeing health care to all New Yorkers. And this is something Mitch and I worked on a lot of years ago. NYC Care, want to keep telling everyone, available to all New Yorkers regardless of ability to pay, regardless of documentation status. If you're a New Yorker who doesn't have health insurance, doesn't know what to do, or doesn't qualify for health insurance, call 311. Just call 311 and we'll sign you up right away for NYC care through health and hospitals. You'll have a primary care doctor. You'll have all the specialty support you need. Only New York City is doing this in the entire United States of America. And that's because of the leadership of Dr. Katz and the whole team at health and hospitals. So thank you very, very much. All right, now let's talk about recovery. My favorite topic, a recovery for all of us. And a recovery for all of us means reaching every community, not just replacing the status quo, but coming back better, addressing the challenges we faced in COVID, learning from them, acting on them, and also giving people opportunity, because people need jobs and opportunity right now. So we, we borrowed from one of the most powerful examples in the history of New York, the history of the United States, the Civilian Conservation Corps, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal. We created the City Cleanup Corps. We're gonna be hiring 10,000 workers total, thousands of whom have already been hired. Uh, the remain will be hired in the next month or so. These are good paying jobs. They give people opportunity. They give people a chance to give back to New York City, do something great in our moment of need. Anyone interested, if you want to help New York City right now, if you're looking for a good job, if you're looking for opportunity, go to nyc.gov ccc. Join this extraordinary group of New Yorkers who are making a difference. I was with one of the CCC teams in Brooklyn last month. It was wonderful. The pride they took in the work, the thank yous they were getting from community members, the impact they were making. We have a new approach now. I love this name. These are neighborhood cleanup swarms. Cleanup swarms. This is a new uh, part of our language now. 
And I'm going to show you the impact of a cleanup swarm when we send a lot of CCC workers together to the Lower East Side in this case. And you can see from the before and after that a real impact made to beautify the community, to clean up from COVID, to move us forward. Lower East Side uh, was a recipient of this great work to begin. bed -Stuy starting on Monday, moving all over the five boroughs with cleanup efforts. You're going to see a lot of before and after. You're going to feel another example of New York City coming back. Um, leaders all over the city are saying, hey, send us the City Cleanup Corps. We want it. We need it. Someone who has reached out and told us how important it will be for his community in the Bronx, and he's fighting to make sure his district always gets their fair share, and we want to make sure the City Cleanup Corps has a big impact for him and his district. My pleasure to introduce Council Member Eric Dinowitz. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. And, and first, I, I also want to thank anyone and everyone who participated in the election yesterday, whether you voted, participated in a campaign, or a poll worker participated in any other way. Thank you. Um, I am very excited for this milestone. Um, you know, during, during the height of the pandemic, you know, we were losing friends and families. Our neighbors were hungry. We were worried about our children in school. We were worried about our jobs. But you know, through all of that, the, the lives of so many of our neighbors, my neighbors here in the Bronx, were impacted still by their, their daily living, their, their quality of life. And my neighbors would share their concerns about uh, graffiti, uh, the, the cleanliness of parks and the streets. And we were all also looking for, for ways to improve our neighborhoods through art and community spaces. So, I mean, we choose our neighborhoods um, in part based on a, a promise, a quality of life. So we choose to live here, to raise our families here, to work, to retire, and, and we deserve to live every day in the neighborhood that we can be proud of. So, and that's not even to mention another opportunity for folks who are struggling to find employment, get back to work. So I'm looking forward to the continued hiring of workers. I encourage people to apply. I'm looking forward to a summer we, where we can enjoy our families and friends with the quality of life uh, that we deserve, especially here in the Bronx. Thank you. Thank you so much, council member. And congratulations to you. You had a really strong showing last night. I know with ranked choice voting, uh, counts continue, but I think it's still okay to say congratulations. You did, you did a hell of a good job, and thank you for being a real believer in the City Cleanup Corps. And we look forward to thank you. A, a good and positive impact on your district. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, let's go over indicators, everyone. Again, continued progress. We got to keep at it, though. More and more vaccinations, that's the key. So, number one, daily number of people admitted to New York City hospitals for suspected COVID-19. Today's report, 74 patients. Confirmed positivity level, 15.58%. Hospitalization rate per 100,000, 0.31. That is good news. Now, number two, new reported cases on a seven-day average. Today's report. 171 cases and percentage of people testing positive citywide for COVID-19 on a seven-day rolling average. Today's report, 0.54 percent. few words now in Spanish, and the topic is on health and hospitals, the impact it's making on the vaccination effort, and why it is a good time for everyone to get vaccinated who has not yet. NYC Health and Hospitals acaba de administrar un millón de vacunas, creando confianza en la comunidad. Ellos han vacunado a más personas de color que otros hospitales. Con ellos, la lucha contra el COVID es nuestra batalla para ganar. Vaya y póngase la vacuna. With that, let's turn to our colleagues in the media. Please let me know the name and outlet of each journalist. We'll now begin our Q&A. As a reminder, we're joined today by Chief Democracy Officer Laura Wood, by Dr. Mitchell Katz, and by Dr. Dave Choksi. First question today goes to Steve Burns from WCBS 880. Hey, good morning, Mr. Mayor. How have you been? I'm doing well, Steve. How are you? I'm good. Got to catch up on some sleep after last night. Yes. But, uh, we'll get <laughs> we, there. we all need a little more today. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, I know it's probably too early to, to prognosticate on any of the results out of last night, given ranked choice voting, but I wanted to take kind of a different tack to start, ask about turnout. I know in recent context, it looks pretty robust, pretty good. Uh, but, you know, we look back at the past civic life of New York City, 
I look back at 1977, we had a 56, 57 percent Democratic turnout in that colorful primary. What do you think has changed about New York civic life over these past few decades where we've gone from that turnout to saying about a 25 percent turnout is robust? And how can we improve that going forward? A wonderful, powerful question. Thank you, Steve. First of all, to be just a bit of a political junkie here. I don't, I don't think any primary ever has quite matched 1977 in terms of just sheer drama. Um, and I do think that's part of it. I think that was a year where just a, a range of candidates and circumstances that really, really brought out people's full energy and attention. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as that. But I really think there are examples in recent years, Obama's uh, victory in 2008, Joe Biden 2020, that there were massive turnout surges around that proved the ability of New Yorkers and Americans to re-engage and really feel the importance of voting. So we know it's possible. That's the good news. We know things like early voting help, absolutely. We got to go farther. We need same-day registration and other reforms that should be much easier to get an absentee ballot. Uh, we need online registration. There's so many things we're still not doing that would clearly increase turnout. But I think the big point here is we have to keep uh, making the reforms and constantly pushing candidates to provide you know, vivid, strong visions that people can latch on to because people have to be inspired. Voting is very emotional. And I think we can do better. I really do. I think we can bring all these pieces together and make turnout stronger and stronger. But the good news here Give early voting its due. It definitely contributed to better turnout. And despite COVID, people still kept engaged and came out. So, so I do think this is ultimately a good sign. But let's do all the next things we need to do to make it better. Go ahead, Steve. I appreciate that and, and agreed on the, the colorfulness of 77. I don't know if we'll, we'll ever get there again. Uh, on, a different, on a different topic, I uh, wanted to ask about a recent ruling regarding what became known as the diaphragm law, a uh, suit brought by several police unions about the law that was passed last year. I wanted to see if you had any reaction to that ruling of it being unconstitutional, and if you thought that lawsuit was brought in good faith by those police unions. I'm not going to get into motivation. I want to get into next steps. I mean, the court has spoken. We have to address the court's concerns. The best way to do that is to pass uh, legislation clarifying the law. The underlying concept of the law is to protect lives of people to create fairness and justice. Uh, we have to do that in the context, obviously, of also protecting public safety and making it clear that our officers need clear rules to do their jobs well. Uh, I think the way to solve all that is to pass an updated version of the law quickly. Go ahead. The next is Katie from the Wall Street Journal. Hey, good morning, Mayor de Blasio. How are you doing? I'm good. Are you related to DJ Katie Honan, who was at the Queen's Night Market? Um, I, are you like cousins or something? I can't. Um, I No comment. I'll, uh, I can't confirm or deny. But I saw uh, someone look really like you. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And did you look up Queen's Get the Money or not yet? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, I think I've learned enough to not quote it. Um, but my question is related to Steve's, you know, looking at turnout. You know, the city invested a lot of money in ranked choice voter outreach and, and things like that. But the turnout, as nice it is to say that it is higher, I mean, it is still really low compared to how many registered voters we have compared to other elections. So is it an issue of the city investing more money or is it an issue of candidates or excitement or, or what do you think that that problem is i think the number one problem was COVID, unquestionably you had the vast majority of the campaign time where people couldn't be out in communities couldn't be generating uh, energy and interest you you didn't have it dominating the headlines the way it would have except for a global pandemic i i think that's objective i think if you took COVID out of the equation ran the same exact play uh ranked choice voting june primary these candidates i think you would have seen a higher turnout uh, but really, the solutions to me, I, I, look, we will find out how well people use ranked choice voting. I'm hopeful that people really got it after a lot of effort, uh, ranked lots of candidates, um, and that it's starting to you know, catch on with people. We're going to find out as we see the full results. 
But I am really accenting the positive because I, I think given that COVID knocked out so much of the energy and focus and, and people were really left preoccupied, that says to me is still pretty amazing. We saw the turnout we did. Uh, the future is about just more and more efforts to reach people, to energize them. Campaigns have a responsibility that, for that too. But ultimately, this is more of a good sign than not. Go ahead, Katie. Thanks, and I know you have you had not formally endorsed. Um, you obviously, I guess there was reporting that you were supportive behind the scenes of Eric Adams. Looking at the results from last night, obviously they are not finalized. But how are you feeling um, with with the results last night? Uh, I guess the top three, it's someone who you're aligned with and then two of your former staffers. So how do you feel looking at these results? I, I feel satisfied. I mean, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I want to respect the fact there's still a lot of process to play out. Um, but now it, it really appears to come down to three people. They're all good people. They're all people that I've had close working relationship with. Um, I think one way or another, New York City will be in good hands. But we really need to recognize, I mean, I want to absolutely give Eric Adams uh, real respect for a very strong showing, but we also have to recognize there's a lot more to play out with a system we've never gone through before, and you know, we have to see the whole process play out. The next is James Ford from PIX11. And good morning, Mr. Mayor and everyone on the call. It is another beautiful day in New York City. James, you and I both like to celebrate the blessings of nature. It's an incredibly beautiful day in New York City. <laughs> yes, it is. That it is. Uh, a question for you uh, regarding education. So on the PIX11 morning news this morning, Michael Mulgrew of the UFT said that there could be, in fact, wait, I have his quote here, we might have a shortage for the first time in a while of teachers coming this fall. I'd like for you please to respond to that statement and let parents know what the situation might be as we look to a school year where you want everyone back in person and possibly because of a teacher shortage might not have enough teachers to have smaller classes. Yeah, I do not believe first of all that's a the smaller classes is a separate question james i'd be a little careful on that uh, we'd all love smaller class size um, there's lots of work being done to keep everywhere we can reducing class size but that's not the same question as a teacher shortage um, i do not see a teacher shortage in the country there's absolutely a teacher shortage in new york city we have not had a teacher shortage in fact we've had a huge number of people who want to be new york city teachers uh, I literally regularly have folks come up to me working for private schools, uh, religious schools who want to get into New York City public schools. It's a very popular destination. Um, if folks, no, absolute respect for Michael Mulgrew, we work with him regularly, but I'm saying this to the bigger public debate. Uh, two jobs that lots and lots and lots of people want, teacher in the New York City public schools and officer in the NYPD. There is a long, long line of people who want those jobs. So I do not see uh, any danger of a shortage. We're bringing back all of our personnel after COVID. Uh, we've augmented uh, because we had to bring in some extra folks in this year and we want to welcome them back as well. I think we're in good shape. If we see anything developing of concern, uh, we'll take steps to address it quickly. But as of this hour uh, in June, I feel very good about where we're going to be in September. Go ahead, James. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And a question uh, for my colleague, Kala Rama. We've gotten a variety of uh, complaints from people regarding Summer Rising, saying that for students with disabilities, Many of them have been placed on a waiting list for Summer Rising. Please respond to that. Thank you. Yeah, I want to know more about that. And James, you and Kyla would do us a favor to please pass on the, some details so we can follow up with parents. Um, Summer Rising is for everyone. And uh, it's an opportunity for kids to have a safe, positive summer with learning, culture, recreation for free. 
Uh, we wanted this to be something unlike anything you've seen before, and it's going to be the permanent model going forward. Of course we want kids with disabilities to be able to participate. So um, please get us information. We'll work to resolve those specific uh, cases. But no, the goal here is to give every parent a positive option. The next is Arthur Chien from Fox 5. Good morning, Mayor. How are you? I'm doing great, Arthur. How are you? Great, sir. Um, I've been sitting along the 59th Street Bridge uh, this morning for a few hours looking at the number of uh, small motorcycles, I'll use that term, uh, to include uh, Vespa-like scooters. Um, and even though the city's DOT confirms they're not allowed on the shared pedestrian and cyclist path, in about an hour we spotted about 40 of them. We even talked to someone who rode one. He says he knows the rules, but everybody's doing it. It's okay. Okay. Uh, we talked to pedestrians and cyclists, and every one of them told us they think it's dangerous to have motorized vehicles on this narrow path. Does the city need to send a message to let people know that not only is this not allowed, but that the city will dissuade them from putting other New Yorkers at risk? Yeah, Arthur, thank you for raising this. And I always uh, try to remember to say thank you to any journalist who raises an a important question that we need to address. And thank you to James before you on the issue around summer rising. We are constantly working to address the issues of this huge, complex city, and sometimes it is a journalist who says, hey, here's something you guys need to focus on that helps us to do things better. So if we need to put more enforcement on the bridge to address that, uh, that's a very straightforward strategy. I'll talk to our transportation commissioner right away, and we will, we will come up with a plan and activate it quickly. Go ahead, Arthur. Thank you. That was my only question and to offer, too. If anybody wants to take a walk from the city, or including yourself, sir, wants to take a walk, we'll show you what we see. We've been doing this. Uh, the first time we talked about this was uh, during the pandemic, and we haven't seen any enforcement or, at, at the very least, any impact from any enforcement um, for this particular problem, especially given uh, the actor Lisa Baines, who lost her life on the Upper West Side from, from uh, exactly this kind of a vehicle. I appreciate what you're doing on this issue, and I'd, I'd like to follow up with you and, and see for myself. Absolutely. Thank you, Arthur. The next is Michael Gartland from The Daily News. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Michael. Late night, but other than that, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. Very late night for me as well. Um, I wanted to ask you about matching funds in the city's public financing system. Um, you know, there's a, a, a sizable Democratic field for the mayor's race. A lot of money poured in, um, you know, for matching funds in that race. And also you had um, PACs pouring a lot of money into that, um, into that race. So my question is, given all of that and given the fact that, you know, you had um, many of these candidates finishing in the... the as of now, single digits. Do you think that needs to be rethought at all? Um, you know, is there a better way to do this moving forward? Do you think the system is as good as is? Um, what are your thoughts on that? No, it's, uh, a good, it's a good question. Rates? Look, Michael, I think anytime we do anything, in this case, it was a referendum my administration sponsored and the people voted for, I think it, it worked overwhelming. I'll tell you why. But I think anytime you do anything, you should keep assessing, keep watching, look for consequences intended and otherwise. I think this worked. I'll tell you why. Um, we had the most diverse mayoral field in the history of New York City. That's a really good thing. Um, one of the best ways to engage people and get them voting, get them involved, is if they can see uh, people who share values with them, people from their community, you know, their borough, uh, people who look like them. It's, it's part of refreshing democracy to show multiple options and give people engagement. And then we'll see how ranked choice voting work, but if it works right, folks learning that their vote has power even if their first choice uh, candidate doesn't win, I think that combination of making it easy for people to run, including people who don't have a lot of money, not, don't have a lot of power, working class people can run now because our campaign finance law allows you to run even if you don't have any big donors at all, and I love that. And this is something that's very meaningful to me. We literally made it possible for someone to run for mayor in New York City and never talk to a big donor. They could do it all with grassroots donations and matching funds. I think that's a victory. I think it was a victory up and down the ballot uh, that people had that opportunity. 
So my hope is that that, in combination with ranked choice, really gives us the most representative government we've ever had going forward and more and more engagement, more and more participation. But we won't really know that until we see some more election cycles and see how it plays out. But so far, I feel good about it. Go ahead, Michael. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I also wanted to ask you, I, I, I kind of doubt you saw this, but uh, Patrick Gaspard tweeted out last night, um, was basically complaining about the, the media coverage of this mayor's race. And I, I think that the basic gist of his what he was saying is that Andrew Yang sucked a lot of the oxygen of this race out early on. And um, basically, I think what he was trying to say is there wasn't enough scrutiny applied to some of the other candidates. And I was wondering if what your thoughts were on that, you know, as far as the coverage of this race and and whether you agree with that assessment that, that not enough scrutiny was um, placed on, on some of the other candidates because of Yang's candidacy. I, I, would, I have not seen the tweet, so I don't want to refer to that specifically. I want to make a broader point, Michael. I appreciate the question. I think the big reality here is COVID took up so much of the space, all of us, emotionally, intellectually, coverage, you know, column inches, airtime. I think COVID made it harder to have the deeper kind of examination of candidates. Um, I do think it's really valuable when the public gets to examine candidates. I think when the media goes out there and does its job and vets candidates, it helps us all. And that was just harder this year. There's no question. I think it sort of started later and it was less intense than what I've seen in other years. Um, but that was, that was a universal challenge uh, that we were all dealing with. And look, I think going forward, we want to make sure we have longer election cycles than we've ever had. We do want the media to really make sure people understand everything they need to know about a candidate, and that's what we depend on the media for. The next is Jeff Mays from the New York Times. Hey, good morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you doing? Good, Jeff. How you been? Good, good. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, in, in 2013, you had, uh, when you won, you assembled this sort of coalition of, you know, black voters, progressive whites. Um, I'm wondering, you know, maybe you can give us a little preview of life after City Hall, put on your political operative hat. And uh, what do you think happened to that coalition last night? Did you did you see that coalition going to any particular candidate or? Um, yeah. Yeah. Look, I'd say, first of all, we don't know enough. I'm going to state the obvious until we see the whole play out of ranked choice. We don't know enough. What was striking to me early on, I was watching New York one and they did the borough by borough breakdown. And I, I did have a sort of immediate uh, reminiscence of 2013 uh, on one piece of the equation. And I give credit to Eric Adams, the strength he created in Brooklyn, in Queens, in the Bronx. Uh, Eric obviously had an outer borough focused, working class focused strategy. Uh, that's a lot of what we did in 2013. Uh, we wanted a multiracial uh, working class coalition with a heavy focus on the outer boroughs. It worked in 2013. It appears to have worked for him here. It's not exactly the same coalition. Obviously, I came out of Brownstone, Brooklyn. I had a lot of strength in Brownstone, Brooklyn. I had some strength in some other places. But um, I think what I saw, at least preliminarily last night, from Eric Adams' uh, achievement is that it did mirror a lot of what we did in 2013. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, thank you. I appreciate the answer. Um, I'm wondering, uh, over the course of uh, the next couple of weeks, um, you know, how, how do you expect the candidates to, to handle themselves? Um, you know, very, you talked about... You know, very, very carefully. <laughs> that would be my advice, but go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> no, you said there, you know, there's still votes to be counted. Um, you know, are, are you, do you have any advice for them? Should, should people avoid claiming victory. I mean, what, you know, what do you expect from, from the candidates? Look, it's a new model that we all have to experience. Um, clearly, last night, again, Eric had a strong number. Uh, he had every right to go out there and talk about it. But from this point on, I think everyone has to recognize that there's a lot more to play out in this process. Um, let's let the process fully 
uh, be unfold, fully unfold, and see the final results formally. I think every candidate, and I think three objectively are still in the running, uh, should be mindful that we don't know the final result until we get it. Um, and we're going to respect the process. We want to make it very transparent. Uh, and then we got to get to work bringing the whole Democratic Party together uh, and starting to work on the future of this city. So when I say very carefully, I think it's for two reasons. One, we've never used this system before. Let's be careful not to judge too much. Let's let the system play out. And two, we all have to work together when this is over. It will be over in a few weeks. Then we have to get back to the work of bringing the city back and creating a recovery for all of us. And I think everyone has to be mindful of that. We have time for two more for today. The next is Henry from Bloomberg. Hello, Mr. Mayor. A little time to talk to. Yeah, Henry, how you been? I've been excellent, and I hope you have too. Thank you for that. I have been. Good. Well, I had a bunch of questions, and I just got stuck on your answer to Jeff Mays that Eric Adams uh, reflected the same coalition that you did, because if there was one candidate who said that stop and frisk could be done correctly uh, and should be actually expanded with better training, et cetera, it was Eric Adams. And this was a signature of uh, part of your platform, along with universal pre-K. And I got to tell you, as an observer of this campaign, I do not see Eric Adams as the inheritor of your coalition, uh, perhaps Maya Wiley, but certainly not Eric Adams. So I was hoping you might expand on that a little bit, or at least consider my observation of this. It's a good question, and I, I, I'm happy to have an opportunity to speak to it, because I think there's been a certain amount of misunderstanding, honestly. Um, my coalition began in Brooklyn, uh, obviously Eric's as well, and my coalition focused on the outer boroughs. That's what Eric did. My coalition had a very strong African-American element. That's what Eric had. Obviously, a strong Latino element. That's what Eric had. Uh, I agree if you say, you know, with Maya Wiley, who's someone I have a lot of respect for, worked very closely with, that there's elements of her approach and her coalition that are also very reminiscent of what we did, absolutely. But I'm just saying the sheer reach and the numbers, what Eric did was closest to what we did. I ended up with 41% in the 2013 primary. Uh, we kind of flipped the script of what was done historically. For too many years in the city, everything was Manhattan outward. We said we're doing outer borough inward. We're going to focus on the votes of the 7 million of us that live in the outer boroughs uh, with Brooklyn as the starting point. So I think that's where there's some real similarity. But on the substance, uh, it's really important to have the conversation, Henry, because I got to know Eric decades ago when he was fighting against police brutality and challenging the orthodoxy of the NYPD, uh, fighting constantly against a broken status quo. He clearly spoke out against the unconstitutional use of stop and frisk. Uh, he's someone who was a charter member of those movements for police reform. I found it quizzical over these last, this last year or so how some of that history got airbrushed out too often. I think it was front and center for years and years and years and very well covered. I think there's a few times he could have said it more clearly. I believe very fundamentally what he has been saying is there is an appropriate and limited way to use stop and frisk. If you do it constitutionally, if you do it for very specific reasons, of course it's still a tool to be used, but used sparingly and correctly. That's what I've said plenty of times publicly, too. Uh, so I don't feel he said anything but that. And I remember he was one of the people that fought against the overuse of stop and frisk. So that, that's where I see actual consistency throughout. Go ahead, Henry. OK, we'll have to save this discussion for a, a later day, but it's interesting to hear your response. Uh, the New York City budget is it's getting late in the month. Got to get that budget up to Albany. You got to get printed. What are the issues that are outstanding? And, you know, why hasn't it been resolved? 
at this point? What still needs to be done? We've made a lot of progress. There's been constant negotiation with the city council. Of course, Henry, you know, we're all realists here. A lot of council members understandably had to focus on the election right in front of them. Um, it was hard for people to put quite as much time as they normally would into a budget, but what's happened is a lot of work has gone on from the executive budget in April till now, constant negotiations. Um, I think we're agreeing on a number of areas, but we still have some things to work through. And we have more information coming in still um, about the different options. We're going to get done, I'm very confident, we'll get done in the next week. Um, and, you know, I think we had something very unusual. Remember, we never had a June primary for city council before. We always used to be able to do the budget without anyone having to worry about electoral dynamics right in front of their face. This is the first time we had to overlap the two. So we've built a foundation to get it done, and now there'll be very intensive effort in the next few days. But I feel good about the outcome. Last question for today goes to Yoav from the city. Hi, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to ask you about vaccine tourism. Um, my understanding is, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it currently only applies to residents of uh, other states. Would you um, support expanding that to international tourists, or, or does that bring concerns about potential variants uh, into play? I would say it this way, and I'll turn to Dr. Choksi and Dr. Katz, who know a lot more than me. Um, I believe if people come here for whatever reason, we should vaccinate anyone who needs to get vaccinated. That's just in our interest. That's in the city's interest, the country's interest, the globe's interest. I don't imagine a scenario, maybe I'm missing something, where people travel all the way here from far away to get vaccinated. I believe people have the resources to do that, probably are able to get vaccinated in their home countries, but maybe that's a debatable point. I would start with, if people come here and need vaccine, we should give them vaccine. I think that's just good common sense. Dr. Choksi, then Dr. Katz, speak to this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and um, I agree with you. Uh, the key point is that uh, vaccination is critically important to keeping New York City safe, uh, but also is critically important uh, anytime anyone is embarking upon travel, uh, particularly because we know uh, that travel is uh, a risk factor for spread of the virus. So if there are ways that New York City can further support ensuring that people uh, who are traveling are vaccinated, that means that all of us will be safer. And Dr. Katz, you want to add? I agree with what both of you have said. Thank you so much. Thank you. Go ahead, Yoff. Uh, well, I, I guess I wanted to ask the doctors, um, because you mentioned that, that you haven't heard of it. Um, we, we, do, we do believe it, it, it's happening and just want to see if, if either doctor has an idea uh, to, to what extent um, international folks are traveling here primarily to get the vaccine. And, and again, if you could just confirm, it, do, do you know whether the rules, I, I guess, do you need to be a, a U.S. resident currently to get the vaccine or, or not? So I'm, I'm going to turn to the doctors, though, but Yoav, I want to ask you a clarifying question. You said we believe it's happening or we, I, I'm not hearing the why you believe it's happening. Do you have something specific we should know about? Uh, just, just anecdotally. Anecdotally documented? A anecdote, anecdotally uh, speaking to folks, uh, primarily from South America, who, who have done it, the vaccine is incredibly hard to get in, in some of those countries. Right. Now, just I'm, I'm staying with you one more second. People who say they came here, they traveled all the way here just to get vaccinated. Is that what you're saying you've experienced? Correct. Okay. Yeah. That's, a, that's a new, I have not heard that report before. I don't want to uh, miss the meaning of it. Dr. Choksi, Dr. Katz. Answer as best you can now. Have you seen evidence of this? And how do we handle someone who's not from the United States but would like to get vaccinated here? Um, certainly. So what I will say is that we have heard about this more um, in, in cities like Miami, where uh, there are more reports of people who are traveling to get vaccinated. Uh, we haven't, um, at least quantitatively, you know, heard about that happening at any scale for New York City. 
It is complicated by the fact that New York City, as we all know, is, um, is a global metropolis. We have many people uh, living in New York City who uh, spend some months of the year, uh, you know, some time um, living between the city uh, and other places, uh, particularly in South and Central America. And for them, you know, the clear message is, uh, if you're a New Yorker, you know, we want you to get vaccinated and we will do everything in our power um, to extend, you know, access to vaccination uh, for you as well. For someone who is, you know, a, a truly living outside of the United States, um, I think that is a different case. And our priority is for, uh, for people who are U.S. residents. Dr. Katz, anything you'd like to add? Uh, nothing. Uh, you guys have covered it very well. Thank you. That's what we're here for. Okay, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Again, I'm going to close where I began. I really appreciate that despite all the challenges, New Yorkers came out and vote. They came out to vote, came out to make their voices heard. Again, a little patience, not our strongest suit as New Yorkers. It's going to take a few weeks to get the final results of this election. But thank you to everyone who participated, uh, keeping democracy strong no matter what's been thrown at us. And this is going to be a good beginning to a recovery for all of us. Thank you, everyone.